Welcome to Bryant University. I am Glenn Silmacy, Provost and Chief Academic Officer at Bryant University. On behalf of everyone at Bryant University and the Rhode Island Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us for the first in our series of three virtual moderated panels. Pandemic economics, what does it mean for Rhode Island? The focus for today's panel is a time for strategic leadership. And before I continue on, I just wanted to extend thanks to Cecilia Cooper, Liz O'Neill, Phil Lombardi, Dan Green, and of course, Dr. Eddie Tibaldi, who is the brainchild of this three-part seminar series. So thanks to Eddie and all of Bryant for their support. We are extremely pleased to convene this distinguished group of leaders today to, to provide perspective, insights, and guidance as we all navigate through the difficult challenges we face because of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. We have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started by introducing our moderator for today, Edward Fitzpatrick. As a reporter covering Rhode Island for the Boston Globe, he worked for 16 years at the Providence Journal, including eight years as the political columnist, and also as the court reporter for many years. He previously served as the Director of Media and Public Relations at Roger Williams University, where he launched a First Amendment blog and taught journalism there. A native of the Ocean State, he graduated from Syracuse University with a degree in magazine journalism and political science. He is a member of the New England First Amendment Coalition Board. It's my delight, thank you, Ed, for being our moderator today. And now, let us begin the pandemic series. Thank you, Provost, and welcome, and thanks to everybody joining us today, and thank you to Bryan University and to <clears throat> the Rhode Island Foundation for inviting me to be your moderator for this panel on strategic leadership. This is the first in a series of virtual panels on pandemic economics and what it means to Rhode Island. The objective of this series of panels is to help Rhode Islanders better understand the impact of COVID-19 on the state economy and how leaders can calibrate an appropriate policy response. I now wanna introduce some of our state's most accomplished and distinguished leaders, uh, beginning uh, with our uh, panel here. Um, the Honorable Ronald K. Makeley has led Bryant University to unprecedented growth in his 24 years as president. His pivotal contributions in academic excellence, enrollment campus expansion and technology have established an exceptional foundation for continued success for the university. <clears throat> President Makeley previously served as a three-term U.S. Congressman representing Rhode Island from 1989 until 1995, and he was a practicing attorney for 10 years prior to being elected to Congress. A 1970 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, Makeley earned a uh, JD from Suffolk University Law School. He served on active duty in the U.S. Navy and retired as a captain from the Naval Reserves after 25 years of service. His civic engagement has included serving on the boards of the Rhode Island Foundation and as president of the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council, where he's now a member of the Board of Directors. In 2011, President Makeley was recognized by the New England Board of Higher Education for exceptional leadership on behalf of higher education and the advancement of educational opportunity. Also joining us on the panel, um, Neil Steinberg uh, is the president and chief executive officer of the Rhode Island Foundation. Uh, he works to address the needs of Rhode Island's diverse communities through philanthropy, grant making, and community leadership. In 2018, with assets of approximately 970 million, the organization raised 114 million and distributed $52 million in grants. Previously, Steinberg served as Vice President of Development at Brown University, his alma mater. He also worked for Fleet Boston Financial, rising to the position of Chairman and, and CEO of Fleet Bank Rhode Island. His civic engagement includes serving as Director of the Providence Foundation, the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council, the Providence Performing Arts Center, and the Urban League. A sought after expert on philanthropy, the Rhode Island economy, community issues, and public education Providence Business News named him one of the 30 driving forces of Rhode Island's business community in, 20, in 2016. He holds a degree in applied mathematics from Brown. Also on the panel, distinguished economist and economic 
Development Expert, Dr. Ross Gattel, Chancellor of the Community College System of New Hampshire since 2012. He'll become the president of Bryant on July 1st. Highly regarded in economic and policy circles for his analysis and forecasting, Dr. Gattel frequently serves as an expert, expert resource for government, nonprofit, and business leaders, regionally and nationally, on such issues as economic policy, workforce development, and the business climate. He previously was the James R. Carter Professor in the Department of Management and the Whittemore School of Business and Economics at the University of New Hampshire. He also taught at the New School for Social Research in Manhattan, in the School of Education, Economics Department, and Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He holds a PhD in public policy from Harvard University, an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's in economics from the University of Chicago. And our first speaker for today's program is Stephen Pryor, Rhode Island's first Secretary of Commerce, appointed by Governor Raimondo. He oversees and coordinates the state agencies and offices responsible for economic development, business regulation, housing, and workforce development. Rhode Island's economic progress under Governor Raimondo has been profiled by national publications, including the New York Times. He has served as Deputy Mayor and Director of Economic and Housing Development for the City of Newark, New Jersey, and as president of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, created in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks to plan and help coordinate the physical rebuilding and economic revitalization of Lower Manhattan, including the World Trade Center site. He also served as the Commissioner of Education for the state of Connecticut. Pryor uh, received his undergraduate and law degrees from Yale University. Secretary Pryor is going to be our first speaker today, and he'll um, deliver some introductory re remarks now about the reopening phases of Rhode Island's economy. Secretary Pryor. Ed, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay yet? Yes. Fantastic. I'm so glad to be with you. And President Makeley, thank you for hosting us. It's always a pleasure to work with you and with Bryant. Uh, we congratulate you on all of your accomplishments and we are grateful for your partnership uh, institutionally and personally. Um, and uh, incoming President Gattel, we're extremely excited to work with you. Uh, and Provost Silmasi, uh, we really enjoy working with you at all times. Glenn, it's a pleasure to see you. Um, and I'm grateful to Eddie. Eddie Tabaldi is an advisor to us uh, in the state through thick and thin uh, with cr constructive critiques as well as great intellectual contributions at all times. So what a, what a wonderful a uh, fantastic group. And I have to say, Neil Steinberg has been an amazing collaborator through, through everything for our administration. But through this crisis, uh, I cannot possibly express the degree to which Neil's been involved and has been invaluable. What I want to do, Ed, is to talk about the reopening process for Rhode Island and share uh, as a preface to the broader and deeper conversation that you are to have uh, what we are aiming to do to reopen the economy. Let me set the stage this way, if I may, Ed. Um, Rhode Island has uh, been very mindful of public health expertise and advice as to the shutting down of portions of the economy deliberately and carefully in order to ensure that we can flatten the curve, to, in order to uh, ensure that we don't see a trajectory that is ever escalating in terms of our numbers of COVID cases, and uh, one cannot ever rest on laurels or uh, assume that a full solution has been achieved, but we have indeed substantially flattened the curve. Uh, we are seeing cases and hospitalizations uh, stabilize uh, and plat plateau, and we even are seeing decreases uh, for stretches of time on some of the key indicators, meaning that we are uh, undergoing the kind of stable situation that will enable us to begin the reopening, and in fact, we are. In addition, before I get to the reopening, let me express that we have taken pains to keep aspects of the economy open, even as others of our regional neighbors have closed such industries. So, for example, manufacturing and construction have remained open all the way through the crisis, we have not done across the board or even partial subsector closures in manufacturing and construction, which is uh, in contrast with our nearby neighbors. 
Um, and we've done so in partnership with the industry associations that have themselves issued guidelines, in the case of the manufacturers, a pledge that manufacturers have voluntarily submitted to and have self-policed in order to stay open in a safe manner. <clears throat> so we, we have a strong platform upon which to build as we do begin to reopen. Just this past weekend, we started to uh, unveil and in fact implement uh, reopening plans in the form of retailers, non-critical retailers, that is to say clothing shops and bookstores and gift shops were authorized to reopen if they met certain criteria. Um, the criteria are straightforward. Uh, there's a, a handful of check boxes on a checklist that a non-critical retailer must fill out and may proudly display to show that they are taking on social distancing, mask wearing for customers and for personnel to sanitize the facility in a frequent manner and to have in place ultimately a broader plan for very safe and healthy environment inside the retail store. So retailers have started to do that. Some have chosen to reopen. Some are still planning their process of reopening. No rush and we entirely support that. Uh, but we're pleased that among the Southern New England states and uh, uh, among the very few in the Northeast we're the first to reopen retail. We're moving on to restaurants. We're, gonna, we're going to enable restaurants to open for outdoor seating, recognizing that that's not the totality of the restaurant economy, nor is that the totality of the revitalization of hospitality. But we are moving towards the op reopening of outdoor restaurants, and the governor will have words to say about that early this week, perhaps as soon as today pertaining to how outdoor seating can be set up, what kind of distancing should exist between tables, how masks should be weared by customers and servers in that context, how to ensure that the uh, utensils being utilized are sanitized or disposable to ensure that no common objects like ketchup and mustard bottles or salt and pepper shakers are being utilized, the, the straightforward things that need to happen to make the environment safe enough for us to allow business to restart. Uh, so we're very pleased with the fact that Rhode Island, which has had a history of being the first in and last out of recessions, is aiming to be a leader in our region in getting back to business. So again, because we've kept certain sectors open, manufacturing and construction, we have a head start. And because we are among the first and in our a portion of the region, the first, to reopen retail and restaurants, we are, we are aiming to proceed ahead in a way that's responsible, that's incremental, that's in accordance with thoughtful and clearly presented public health guidelines, and that will enable us to move into future phases where greater reopenings can occur and we can look at, you know, for example, shifting from remote work to in-office work in, in the case of office-based businesses. We're asking them to be very disciplined right now and really emphasize remote work with occasional exceptions. We're looking to reopening uh, closer contact businesses like hair cutters and um, tattoo parlors and you know, other uh, businesses that require even greater thought and uh, very rigorous sanitation. And ultimately our entire economy uh, is to be reopened again. Just a, a final note, if I may add, just on the bigger picture, we recognize that the incremental reopening of the economy, though it may happen in advance of others and may help to propel us, um, will not be enough to truly advance our economy into the new era. And just a couple of thoughts on that point. Um, we in Rhode Island are blessed with remarkable assets in the areas where the world is looking to advance. The two I would point to in, in quick closing remarks would be these, bioscience and material science. What do I mean by that? Uh, the world is looking to uh, remedies and looking to vaccines for the purpose of COVID, of course, but we're also looking ahead to future potential pandemics. We can't ever act as if we're immune and it will not occur. 
and we need to invest in the bioscience complexes like the Brown Medical School, URI Nursing School, Rick Nursing School, and the 195 District, like the medical practitioners and researchers who are doing life-saving work, like our su superb uh, expertise in neuroscience, which is an important part of future human development um, and progress. So we need to double down on that. And I think we need to make major investments now, including the study of viruses and vaccines, to be sure, but beyond. Uh, and we have the infrastructure for it. We have the initial assets. The second area is material science. And by this, I mean the outgrowth of our boat building industry for defense purposes and for recreational purposes, our boat building industry uh, has, uh, has included the development of composite material science with a network of businesses and researchers who are superb at the development of composite materials for various applications. Might we now advance with that expertise, with the expertise of RISD and its design excellence, with the engineering schools at URI and at Brown, with the management and business expertise of Bryant, with all of our university partners, might we endeavor to develop new touchless technologies that are digital and that are analog, that will help people enter doorways and manipulate other technologies in a way that makes sense. Payments and other retail experiences and entertainment experiences and well beyond. Might we also develop material science solutions pertaining to virus resistant surfaces and easily cleaned and self cleaning surfaces and other instances of progress that we can only imagine through charrette and through brainstorming to take the world forward. So Ed, uh, we look forward to a world in which Rhode Island can lead on all of these fronts. And I'm very grateful for this forum. Back to you, sir. Thank, thank you. You really touch upon uh, one of the key topics we're going to cover today about how Rhode Island has traditionally been first in, last out of recession. And so just before you go, I know you have to leave, but what, what would you say is the main thing Rhode Island needs to do to break that cycle and, and to come and to bring this economy back uh, quicker and, and make that U-shaped uh, recovery uh, more like a V? Well, uh, I, I think uh, some of the points I've touched upon already are the key, but I would add some. So I would say being careful not to close those industries we could maintain with safety precautions in place, such as construction and manufacturing, has been key. So, you know, obviously we were the birthplace of the industrial revolution here in Rhode Island. The fact that we've been able to keep manufacturing open and never had uh, a significant pause, I think is to the credit of Rhode Islanders and the manufacturers in our midst. And that will give us a boost into the new era. We will have lost less of our GDP in the process and we'll be able to restore more. Now, having said that, um, the incremental uh, uh, reopening of other sectors and other settings for business is not enough to boost us in the context of this very substantial downturn, whatever it turns out to be re recession or worse uh, in this period of time. I think that uh, we, we need to be very careful to build a culture that is conscious of social distancing that is mindful of techniques such as mask wearing, that reconfigures workplaces around these kinds of rules, separating workers so that they don't need to intersect into teams or pods so that they can effectively operate in a way that doesn't require intermingling. Also enabling us, uh, if in the unfortunate but inevitable set of circumstances where there's uh, an outbreak, we can identify the subset of people in a business, the team or pod that needs to be quarantined and not the entire business shutting down. There are techniques such as these that we need to implement through the socialization uh, and the familiarization process so that business people can operate in a way that enables them to maintain business operations, achieve that continuity, even when there are the inevitable mini outbreaks and, and worse. Um, and I, I think that we also need to make major investments in the areas that I described and more to ensure that we are ahead of the curve 
on investing in the places that the world's going to look for new consumer demand and new economic activity. All right, very good. Thank you, Secretary Pryor, for your remarks and for being with us today. We know you're busy attending to the demands of, the, of this health crisis in Rhode Island, and we appreciate that you're able to take the time to speak to our audience today. Uh, and now we're going to move to uh, the rest of our panel. Uh, each panelist is going to uh, begin with opening remarks in response to uh, this question. How do you approach leadership at this time of crisis? And what is the most important thing for Rhode, Island to, for Rhode Islanders to understand in this moment? Uh, and we're going to uh, begin with uh, President Makeley. Mute myself here. Let me thank you very much, Ed, for being the moderator. Also like to thank uh, our panelists, particularly Neil Steinberg uh, from the Rhode Island Foundation and my successor, a distinguished educator and an economist who I believe will really be able to help our state think through this, not just with this moment of, of COVID-19, but for the future. When I was in the Navy, we had uh, an old saying, when your ship is hit with a torpedo, fight the flooding first, then fight the battle. And so I think there's an analogy here. This recessionary cycle that we're going through right now, in April, the Wall Street Journal on Saturday announced, we have uh, lost 20.5 million jobs in one month nationwide, 14.7% unemployment. Now it's not as high as the Great Depression, which was probably 25%, but it is a massive number of people who have become displaced, not because of a traditional economic cycle, but because of the health issue resulting around the COVID-19. 17% of the people who have lost their jobs nationwide are in the service industry, which is where Rhode Island is right now, frankly. Uh, the numbers for Rhode Island, I understand, will come out probably at the end of May, so that our next two and third conference will be able to deal with the specific numbers. But let me talk about uh, how you focus on the healthcare needs immediately. I want to commend the governor and Stefan and all the people at the State House who are working to deal with both the flattening of the curve and the testing and the idea of reopening. But the first problem of the flooding is we need to have dissemination of information which we all can use. What are the best tests that we should be doing to reopen? How do we go about getting uh, confirmation that we can get those tests? The tests are now costing about $100 per test. And so should the industry have everyone who is going to come back to work tested once? And if you test them once, what's the follow-on testing process? And if we're going to have those tests, how do we go about getting the results back? And then how do we quarantine? So you need a core group that's going to start disseminating information on the basics of the healthcare needs. Secondly, you're going to need a core group that's focused on what's the technology needed to use the surveillance of once people come back. You can't get hand, held hand thermometers. They don't exist on the current market right now. So how are we going to do this? What's the best screens that people walk through? What's the best equipment to spray your, your quarters when people leave their, their work? What's the material that you spray with? All of these healthcare needs need to be disseminated quickly because if we're going to open as early in higher education as September, we need to order those things right now and we need to make sure that they're gonna be available. So someone has to be directing us to understand those issues. Finally, this will be perhaps as a big a leap for our country as it will be for Rhode Island. How do we follow up with surveillance and tracing? Are our country and our people ready to give up their freedom of information to put into a system, whether it's Google and Apple, or whether it's a local system, so you can track people? The vaccine is probably not gonna be available for eight to 15 months, which means realistically, we're gonna to have to go through till January without knowing that we have people in our midst who are either asymptomatic or who have this virus. Finally, what's our risk? What's our risk tolerance as this comes back into play? How are we gonna quarantine people to protect the elderly and those people who have deficiencies in immunity, which we really have to protect? Uh, we should be looking at what's happening in Sweden right now. How are they doing it as they began uh, to 
herd Im immunized the elderly and those people who were uh, with uh, immunity deficiencies or, or diabetes or other conditions. We're gonna have to think about that. And so the leadership's gonna require dissemination of this information really quickly to everyone. So we're not trying to figure it out on the front lines. Right now, I think we're all trying to figure out what tests, where do we get the test? How do we measure? How do we do the surveillance? How do we find out when people have a, a uh, confirmed case? How do we isolate them? And how do we then track who else they saw when they came back to work and where were they? These are big questions that uh, they're gonna to have to follow. And I, I, I don't say this critically, I'm just suggesting that this will be the next step of leadership. And the governor has been, I know, working on getting someone who's a really hardworking guy on the testing, but we need to disseminate that. Finally, I think that we're going to have to think about what happened to all these small businesses, which uh, have been given some loans, some deferment of payments, the small restaurants, the small organizations, which is the fabric of Rhode Island, to make sure they can come back. If they're not able to come back strong, then uh, it'll be hard to grow the economy in new areas because we won't have the fundamental framework of what has made Rhode Island great. So I'm optimistic that the governor's on the right track. We did a Hasenfeld study uh, here at Bryant and the statistical information that came out of that said, people trust the governor. They trust what she's been doing so far. Now we have to take it to the next level because quickly, uh, she's announced we're going to uh, start to reopen as, as our Secretary of Commerce just announced, but we need to have the information of disseminating healthcare needs uh, before we get into the opening and realize we're not prepared for that. So it's, it's a process of uh, leadership that uh, has to continue. And uh, I think every business is ready. And frankly, I think that this may be critical and I don't mean it that, but I think the media has to stop putting fear into everyone's dialect and, and thought process and give us hope that we can in fact recover and move into a recovery. Because if we don't recover and bring jobs back, the economy is going to go into a depression and that will be a disaster, not only for Rhode Island, but for the country. All right, very good, President. Um, and now we are gonna have the same question asked to Mr. Steinberg. And just to repeat it, how do you approach leadership at this time of crisis? Uh, and what is most important for Rhode Islanders to understand in this moment? Thanks, Ed. And I want to, uh, as everybody else, acknowledge Bryant and the panel and the leadership of this group um, in getting together to address this and all of those who are participating today and your good guidance here, Ed. Um, you know, a lot of things, Ron obviously hit on a lot of important points. Um, uh, leadership, whether you're leading an organization, you're leading into the economy, whatever, uh, this is a time where there's so much uncertainty. I've never seen in my decades so much uncertainty. So we're leading, we're guiding, we're aiming um, while it's unfolding. And uh, what you have to deal with is what's in front of you, but also prepare for down the road. <clears throat> so I think things like transparency and direction and um, good information, quality information uh, are all important, but also recognizing that we need to be flexible, <clears throat> we need to be nimble. I think one of the strengths of a small state is being nimble, and I agree. I think the governor, I think Dr. Alexander Scott, uh, Stefan and others have done a great job, still with a lot of unknowns. So for example, on the economy, um, unfortunately, I, I think what the, the uh, data tells us is, we are back where we were in 2008, 2009. We have an economy that is overly dependent compared to a lot of other states on small businesses in tourism, hospitality, um, uh, retail, gambling, whatever. A lot of low wage jobs, a lot of people employed in those areas, but that's a big dependence that we've had. It's a big dependence that we recognize. And candidly, that's where the hardest hit industries uh, seem to lie. So. We, we've got to look not only at what got us here, but, but where we go. And I think one of the things that, that isn't being addressed enough um, with all good intentions and all plans is consumer confidence. And there's a lot of data out there, or, or at least uh, uh, articles and surveys about how people feel. So you could open up every restaurant today. I don't know how many people are going to go rushing back. We've had restaurant owners in other states say, 
you know, we're not ready, uh, our employees aren't ready to come back. So how the consumer is going to act and how the consumer is going to respond and be confident, it's a two-part story. So as Ron noted, we've got to give a lot of good information. Uh, how are we going to do testing? How are we going to get people ready? And then people need to be ready to take the lead. And things have changed for a lot of people here. Um, one of the concerns we have is at the foundation, we sit at the intersection of business, government, and, and nonprofits and see a lot of need. And we'll talk about that a little later. But um, what you're seeing, though, is, is because of that uncertainty, um, what people are willing to do, try to do, and how much has their life changed now? So I would say to some people, you will hear, gee, I'm finally having dinner with my kids every night. We're not over scheduled with going to things. I'm taking a walk. I'm doing this. That's a privilege group. There's just as many, unfortunately, if not more, who are crowded in an apartment. They're not seeing adequate um, uh, funding for what they need. They're going to high risk jobs at, at lower wages and still experiencing challenges and in some cases, um, very tough situations. So we're, we're all going to learn from this. So I'm going to say a couple of things that, that I think are really important. Um, one is that we hear the term new normal, and that's being thrown around all the time. I have concerns about the new normal, and I have the concerns for a couple of reasons. One is the new normal short term. It's six to 18 months. That's what the new normal when people reference, how are we going to do things now? Secondly, the old normal wasn't that great for everybody. We left too many people behind in the old normal. So when you look at the economy, whether it's here or it's nationally, even during boom times, we left many people behind. The educational achievement gaps, the health disparities, the economic security gaps, being dependent on your zip code for your outcomes, that wasn't great then. And so a new normal doesn't, doesn't quite do it for me. What I really think we need is a better future. And that's looking a little long-term. So new normal, how do we adapt in the next 16 months? But beyond that, how do we build in Rhode Island a better future? How do we double down? How do we commit to education, K through 12, higher ed, to train our workforce? How do we focus on education in terms of getting rid of the achievement gaps? How do we provide for health? So if you had health challenges before this pandemic, it's only gotten worse whether it's the elderly, whether it's chronic conditions, how do we address that for the long term? And how do we skill up? How do we change the dynamic? It's wonderful to talk about new industries. We don't have the workforce right now for that, for all those new industries. So I'm looking at not only a new normal being a better future, but then how do we address these underlying factors? And I think the, the way we need to do it and the way it's, it's working all together, and that's what's gonna take, everybody having hope in the state, everybody working together, is to not only look at the basics, maybe go back to some of the basics, but also how innovation fits in. So when I say the basics of, let's get rid of the achievement gaps, let's provide everybody with a world-class education in Rhode Island over the next 10 years, innovation, how do we then use this uh, distance learning? the remote learning that we've started to experiment with. On the health side, how do we get people healthier? How do we address the social determinants? How do we use telehealth that now seems to get people the opportunity they might not have? And so I think a lot of these things are going to be balanced. I think uh, with leadership, it's going to be collective leadership. I think that we need to look longer term. And I think we need to make that commitment. When we get to the very tough state budget, that I know will be covered down the road in, in this series, priorities are gonna be value judgments. So when you have limited resources and you start to allocate dollars, underneath are gonna be the values of the state of Rhode Island. And what are our values? And again, I'm suggesting the values are a great education for everybody and everybody having availability of that, everybody having access to affordable health care and to health outcomes that everybody deserves and economic security so we can help people get back to work and get good jobs. And so how do we get beyond, how do we make a new normal a better future, I think, is the type of leadership that we 
uh, want and, and need in the short term. It's all the things. What's the testing that's required? Uh, what do we do when? I think people are hungry for that information. Where do we take the risks? Uh, where do we play to our strengths? And so one last example I'll use is we have long here been concerned about lack of um, transportation. We do not have great public transportation. We've got the buses, but we don't have great trans public transportation. Well, where do they have great public transportation? Boston and New York. Huge challenges. How do a whole bunch of people crowd onto a subway and get back to work? So we've got to use our size as an asset. You know, that old expression, punch above our weight. I think we can do it in Rhode Island. But again, I think we need to double down on the basics. I think we need to double down on looking at the long term while we're getting through it. As Ron said, once we plug the hole, then fight that battle. But it's, but it's a longer term battle, Ed. Very good. And that's a good way to frame it. What's the new normal going to look like? And, and how do we change normal, that the old normal wasn't all uh, perfect, that we were not as resilient in past recessions. We left some people behind. So how do we make this normal? Uh, uh, bring more people along. So uh, let's go now to Dr. Gattel uh, and to repeat the question, how do you approach leadership at a time of crisis like this and what's the most important thing for Rhode Islanders to understand in this moment? Yeah, first of all, I wanna thank you, Ed, for moderating uh, this important uh, uh, panel and also uh, really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion about Rhode Island uh, its current uh, condition. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on uh, Rhode Island's future and talk about key elements uh, in the recovery process. I do have some slides and some data, and I'm going to try to, uh, to share it, and we'll see if I could do this successfully. Uh, let's see. Okay, can everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so... Um, uh, I agree with uh, uh, President Makeley and others. Uh, right now, the most important thing to focus on for Rhode Island's future, and I'm just trying to go back, is the uh, current situation, the current public health situation. And uh, it's really important to address uh, the immediate needs. And the number one rule uh, of virus economics is go stop the virus if you want to fix the economy. So the efforts of uh, the Rhode Island governor uh, and the Secretary of uh, Commerce to focus on the current pandemic and to make sure it's addressed is very important. But it's also very important to understand that while focusing on the public health concerns, have to act strategically with regards to the positioning Rhode Island for a strong recovery and to uh, reverse what really happened last time coming out of the recession for Rhode Island. In many respects, it was the first in uh, and the last out. And there's a real opportunity given the current leadership and the current position of the state to not be uh, the last out of the recession and in fact, have a stronger economy uh, going forward. And the key elements of that include uh, responding effectively to what is a really highly uncertain context as Neil emphasized, and it's very dynamic. Uh, in my discussions with uh, President Makeley uh, for Bryan uh, University, we have to react to this dynamic context and do what's best for the institution and for the state of Rhode Island. It's very similar to be on the ground acting in a strategic way, dealing with the current context and the current high uncertainty. It's very important to understand that the state cannot and should not do it alone. There's significant federal money coming in now uh, and over the longer term, that money has to be used effectively. Eventually, that federal money will not come in the way it's coming in now and will have to be used with attention to the opportunity costs. What's the best use of those resources? How do you use federal resources and local resources, uh, phil philanthropic, uh, uh, the uh, private contributions, uh, the nonprofit sector? But how do you leverage that towards the recovery process and invest it? in Rhode Island's future. And in investments in Rhode Island's future, you have to take into account the current economic context and maybe focus on, which I'll present some data, on the context right previous, uh, prior to the uh, pandemic. 
And as everybody highlighted here, and I think uh, Neil most recently, think through behavioral changes that are going to be more sustaining uh, after this uh, pandemic and how people's behavior is going to change and what are the economic implications of that for Rhode Island. And Neil mentioned size is an asset. Size is an asset for Rhode Island. I think the behavioral change that might be important to emphasize is people are going to tend to move uh, away from very high density areas uh, because of their experiences during this pandemic. And Rhode Island being strategically positioned geographically between New York City and Boston, where people are going to migrate uh, from and have uh, easy access to that, but not the same high density, and being a relatively small state and acting as with a smallness and people knowing each other as an asset, Rhode Island could be well positioned for the future. What does that economic mix look like? This is, and the state's gonna to have to focus on the industries in which the state has a competitive advantage. And what this graphic shows on the horizontal axis is Rhode Island's uh, uh, industry concentration relative to the US average. Uh, and as you see, anything to the right of that uh, 1.00, Rhode Island has concentration in that industry greater than the US average and the vertical access is percentage of total employment. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of these industries and I, others have mentioned it, professional and business and IT services. Uh, within that is what uh, Secretary Pryor talked about, uh, the biosciences and material sciences, investment in the scientific uh, uh, science and also uh, in new design development, that's in professional business services. That's a relatively high percentage of Rhode Island's current uh, uh, employment. There's competitive advantage, as you can see, in the high relative concentration of the U.S. There's opportunities to grow that sector. Also, it's important to highlight the strong finance sector uh, and the ability, as Secretary Pryor highlighted, to move that manufacturing to be even more of a presence, focusing on new manufacturing industries. And then I'll highlight the educational services and higher education is within that. And you can see that Rhode Island has strong locational advantages there, very high concentration. And that industry is an economic resource in and of itself. And then it contributes through the science, through the research, through the management of business education uh, to the state's economic future and competitiveness. The most important resource in Rhode Island is the people. And Neil spoke to this. It's the ability to uh, invest in that human uh, capital, uh, that talent uh, in the state, and make sure that we invest that, create greater opportunity. So we move people to a high school diploma and just some college to higher education. And that higher education is aligned with the needs for future economic recovery and growth. And you can see currently Rhode Island's concentration in those who have a college education is yes, it's greater than the US average, but lower than the six state New England average. There's an opportunity to expand uh, the state's economic uh, competitiveness through that economic growth and that investment in human capital to provide the works, workforce for the industries of the future in the state of Rhode Island. At the same time, you're addressing some of the problems with regards to inequality moving more people from some college and high school or no high school diploma to college education will help the state and help advance economic opportunity throughout, throughout the state. And that's one thing that uh, Bryant University along with other higher education institutions in the state are strongly committed to and we will want to continue to partner with the state with the Rhode Island Foundation in achieving this. And as you see, education and training, that higher educational achievement is correlated strongly with economic resilience for individuals. And it's also correlated with economic resilience uh, for a state's economy, having more people with higher educational achievement. And higher education is a strong industry in Rhode Island, as I spoke to earlier. Traditionally, it's been uh, a stable industry through economic cycles. Uh, more vulnerable now with the pandemic and the possible implications in the fall 
for residential colleges, uh, like many are in Rhode Island. But as far as supporting the state, it's relatively resilient, high paying industry, significant employer, and it contributes in many ways to the economic foundations of the state that is critical for the state's uh, future. Very good. I, I know this couldn't move forward. I couldn't, uh, let's see, uh, next, okay. One more. Okay, and then finally, uh, and this is really uh, was emphasized by the other speakers about the industries of the future and what Secretary Pryor highlighted uh, that, uh, you know, for the future, the biosciences and material science, this industry 4.0. It's important to have a higher education uh, be part of that. And uh, it's important for us to look towards that recovery and during the recovery process, focusing our resources, our efforts towards providing those strong industry and a key aspect of these industries are having the educated workforce. So while focusing on the immediate needs and addressing the public health challenges, it's important also to have the eye towards the future, be strategic about it, invest in the state's leading industry, connect in partnership with higher education industry uh, and business and the nonprofits to ensure that this time Rhode Island comes out of this recession stronger and better positioned for future growth. So thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk about Rhode Island and Rhode Island's future. All right, thank you, Doctor. You raised some very good points and, and really underscore the importance of higher education to prepare the state uh, for this future economy and the importance of innovation and having more than a high school degree. But uh, to, to stick with that point, I'm, I'm curious about how, and, and maybe you and, and President Makeley can address, like how do universities and colleges deal with the effects of this pandemic? I mean, are you concerned that people, uh, students are gonna uh, delay coming back? They're gonna be concerned about coming back? How do you keep uh, ensure that they're gonna be safe when they get back in the fall? What are some of the challenges you are, you are facing and, uh, and, and what's gonna happen in, in the fall there, Brian? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm gonna turn it over to President uh, Makeley, but uh, highly uncertainty, very challenging. You know, what um, in discussions now with President Makeley and uh, the provost is uh, going through different scenarios because the context we're really, there's uncertainty about what that uh, uh, public health context is gonna be uh, come September. And we have to go through different scenario analysis. The priority is the health and safety of our, our students, our, our faculty and staff. And we have to work in partnership with our faculty and staff and higher education leaders throughout the state of Rhode Island and public health officials to think of the various procedures, the processes, what we have to have in place with regards to testing and other practices to ensure uh, the safety and health of our students, but you're trying to do uh, address that and also uh, ensure that our students have access to the high quality uh, education and educational experience. So President Makley, you, you, you started us with some details in your presentation. Maybe you wanna to add to that. Uh, thanks. thanks very much, Ross. And thanks very much for sharing your uh, really good insight into the economy. I know you've been working in all of the areas in New England, so it's helpful to be thinking about uh, Rhode Island in a, uh, a digital uh, observation for the, both the current and the future. Uh, Dr. Gattel and I have been spending a lot of time together on a lot of Zoom calls trying to figure out how does our educational institution re-engage come September. Uh, this is critically important for the state of Rhode Island. We have 70,000 students who are engaged in the private educational resources of our state. We cannot not open. If we close down and uh, the parents, all the polls are showing 77% of the parents are not going to pay tuition that is now charged for online learning without having their students come back. We have to figure out a way to bring them back and to educate them in a safe and uh, secure way, maintaining academic excellence. That is Rhode Island's competitive advantage. It is the United States competitive advantage. And so we have to think about, again, going back to the healthcare needs, what are the best tests uh, are, are these uh, tests which are instantaneous? Are they good tests? Do they give us information? 
how do we test students before they come back or do we test them as they come back? What's the test process of surveillance every month, every two weeks, every three months? These are important questions. Here again is where I suggest the state needs to have a core of healthcare professionals working with us right now to answer these questions so that we're not just independently discovering them. We need to work with our federal delegation. We had a conversation with them last week about how are we going to pay for these tests? As I said, they're a hundred dollars a person. So if you have, let's say, uh, 1,200 tests that you would give in a course of a semester, that's $1.2 million on top of your budget that you have to figure out. You can't just uh, disperse that to, to the students. You have to figure out state, local, and federal uh, partnerships. Then you have to have surveillance. That is gonna be critical. And finally, you have to have a process where when you have determined that one of your students has or staff the coronavirus, how do you quarantine them? Where do they go? And what's your risk of total population getting quarantined until you work with the state to have an offsite location? These are a lot of big questions that Dr. Gattel and other health and educational leaders are gonna to have to start to answer really quickly because again, if you're going to buy equipment to spray, if you're gonna buy these testing uh, equipments to uh, uh, test people's temperature, if you're gonna look at uh, technology to uh, trace people, you need that right now to start ordering. You can't wait until August. So it's a big issue, but it's critical that we all work together and uh, I'm, I'm confident that the innovation that was mentioned by Neil, the design thinking that we spent a lot of time helping our students to think about. If we all get into the room and begin to ask these questions together, uh, I think we'll come up with a solution. Yeah, you're, you, you underscore a point there. I was just thinking about uh, with a recent Boston Globe story identified colleges throughout New England that might not survive this pandemic because of the financial impact. None of those colleges uh, that were listed in the story were in Rhode Island, thankfully. But I think, are you getting at the point that this is a real financial crisis in addition to a public health crisis for a higher ed? No question. I just saw statistics that 18% of most colleges have not had their enrollment target met. Uh, and that is already uh, because most small uh, liberal arts and colleges are dependent on tuition. That is a huge problem already. Uh, if you have 100 students that don't return in September because they are afraid of the environment in which they're going to enter. That's a $4 million hit for most colleges and universities. They are already struggling. And, and so we need to use our innovation. What did we learn as, as uh, Dr. Cattell said, what did we learn from the online learning that we can incorporate to, to meet our needs of social distancing, yet the, the fir personal interaction with students? Uh, those are things that have to be discussed. And every college, every college in the United States has the same problem right now. So it's not just Brian's problem. It's not Brown's problem. It's not PC, Salvic. We all have the same. So I know our provost and, and, and uh, vice president of student affairs are getting together. We need to really get quickly focused on how we're going to do this in literally three months. <clears throat> and if I could ask uh, Mr. Steinberg a question, I was curious about the impact that the pandemic, this crisis has been having on philanthropy uh, nationally and in, in Rhode Island. And also if you could give us an update about the uh, Rhode Island Foundation's COVID-19 response fund. I think we can get Mr. Steinberg. Unmute now. Okay, thank you. Following directions. Um, we see wonderful examples every day of Rhode Islanders helping Rhode Islanders. And, and again, we've talked about our spirit of hope and our history here. Um, so I think that uh, what we're seeing is uh, a growth of vulnerable populations. And that's a term that's, that's very broad, but let me make it very simple. As unemployment skyrockets, the term vulnerable populations increases. So people that are touched by that, by the fact that they've lost income, they can't cover expenses, um, a lot of things like that increase this term vulnerable populations. 
and it doesn't appear to be short term. People are impacted, they get behind on things, and yes, we can delay rents and we can provide different funds, but, but none are solutions for the long term. So when this started, as, as you noted, we developed a fund with the United Way, and we've been spending most of our time on really leveraging philanthropy. So what happens to philanthropy in recession? Uh, it kind of the obvious, right? So it takes a hit, but it doesn't dive. Um, philanthropy is a lot of from the heart as well as from the mind and, and the pocket. Um, the other thing that impacts philanthropy, though, I keep talking about uncertainty. So a gyrating stock market negatively impacts philanthropy because people don't make decisions. They don't know if their portfolio is up or down, if they're fortunate enough to have a portfolio. So, um, that actually hasn't been as impacted as many people would have thought. So philanthropy is, is burgeoning. We're built at the foundation. We've been around 104 years. We've been through uh, the depression. We've been through wars. We'll get through this with Rhode Island and for Rhode Island. Uh, so we've raised a little over $8 million for this fund. We've given out already over $7 million. So we're now at that point where the need is starting to overcome the, the resources. So we keep raising the money, the COVID-19 response fund at the Rhode Island Foundation, and, and again, with the United Way. And we keep raising money, and we keep getting $25 gifts to $25,000 gifts to $250,000. And what we ask people to do, and so everybody who's here, who's getting uh, mobilized to look short and long term, is simple. Take care of your family first. Support organizations that you've supported for many years and do good work. And then if you have the means, dig a little deeper and support this response fund. We are working with nonprofit organizations. And you know, you talk about the economy and nonprofits are large employers in the state. So we need this vibrant nonprofit or, uh, uh, group and cohort and industry and sector to take care and to help and to work with people on the ground. So that on the ground res resource of providing food, and rental assistance and others. And, and one other area that I think is very important I wanna to touch on is as this vulnerable population grows, as unemployment has grown, there are direct ties to an increase in behavioral health issues. So whether it's mental health and people feeling depressed or isolated, or whether it's a growth in substance abuse, which is being documented as we speak of drugs and, and alcohol, whether it's, um, uh, domestic violence, which we've seen statistically go up with unemployment, with the stress of health concerns, with not being able to see and embrace family and friends, a lot of challenges arise. So I don't want to be totally negative because we will get through this, but it will take time. And, and that's why I'll go back again, sake of being repetitive. We need to double down. We need to look at how we get through the short term, but how we get the long term. We're not going to have all these industries if we don't educate our kids better. We've shown that. We've shown the results here in public education the last 10 years. Next 10 years, we need to provide world-class education for our kids. We need to make sure everybody has access to health care and so that we get people who are not in that vulnerable population growing and growing. Yeah, you were, in your opening comments, you talked about how the old normal, we were leaving too many people behind. Right. What is the main thing we need to change going forward to avoid uh, that happening when we do get back to that pre-pandemic level, when it, when it is a new normal? Is, is it education? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and again, I'm going to push on kind of moving beyond the new normal to actually building that better future that we need. And yes, it is core, it is getting education. We had too many achievement gaps. We had the highest Latino achievement gap in the United States here, well documented over several years. We need to change that. We need to get every child, every family, the best education we can, not dependent on their zip code. And the other would be on the health disparities, the social determinants of health. If kids, and I'll stick with kids for a minute, are homeless, if kids, do not have stable family situations economically. If kids are not healthy, they will not learn. We've shown that, whether it's lead poisoning or asthma or whatever, we need to provide these basics. And that's where I get back to building those budgets going forward, value judgments, 
making sure we can get the basics to people. That's how we're going to get out of this for the long term. Otherwise, every 10 years, we're going to get whacked. Whatever, nobody knew a pandemic was going to cause a recession. Um, and we need to look at what some of the unexpected things. I'll just throw out one thing that just fascinated me. If somebody told us that the best idea was to shut down the economy in all the industrialized countries of the world for two months to fix climate change, who would have thought? But that's what's happened. We haven't fixed climate change, but we have significantly reduced pollution levels and all that by doing this. The solution is not to keep the economy shut down. How do we capture these things, these learnings right now? So again, I would double down for that future and I would double down and we would double down. I think the community would double down on getting a great education for all of our kids, getting them to higher education, whether it's certificates, two year or four year degrees, preparing so that we can have those industries of the future and having a healthy population while we're at it. Very good, very good. And if I could ask a question to uh, President Makeley and Dr. Gutel, <coughs> uh, Bryant University's um, is, uh, Hassenfeld Institute for Public Leadership just had a interesting poll uh, done that the Globe and other media outlets uh, wrote about. And some of the, the findings were uh, really in, uh, underscored how much of a financial impact this pandemic has had. I think 76% of Rhode Islanders said they had been affected to some extent uh, in their pocketbook by this. Uh, and, that, and that was weeks ago. <clears throat> there was uh, renewed interest indicated there uh, in the role of the federal government to uh, take a more active role about healthcare issues, economic issues, uh, education, technology, and also it, it reflected a greater level of trust in state leaders versus federal leaders. So I, I just wanted to ask uh, President Makeley and Dr. Gattel what your takeaway was uh, mm -hmm. from the, the Hastenfeld poll. Mm -hmm. my uh, mute button there. Let me start it off and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Cattell. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Alan Hasenfeld, uh, a great uh, leader here in our state, approached Brian and asked us, would we be uh, interested in creating a Hasenfeld Institute which would help the state and help government to work together to solve problems? And I think this is one of the important aspects of higher education, which is often lost. We are an intellectual uh, body of very smart people. Dr. Eddie Tibaldi, who uh, was the uh, individual who had this idea for this conference, many of our faculty can in fact help us to solve solu find solutions and solve problems that we face. Whether it's at the K through 12 in education or in the healthcare, our institutions have incredible intellectual capital. And so we began with the Hasenfeld Institute. Uh, Gary Sass runs it and we decided to do a survey to see how do the people view our economy? How do they view our leadership? How do they review it in comparison to the federal government? It wasn't surprising to me that uh, our polling results showed that they are very positive on the governor's uh, handling of our situation at the present time. It also showed, as you pointed out, some very troubling uh, data on how many Rhode Islanders are impacted. And I think when the numbers come out in May, with the Rhode Island economy and we see how many people in Rhode Island are either unemployed or not working, it's going to be devastating. And as Neil said, we have to make sure we take care of these people somehow. They have to get back into the economy because if they're unemployed, they can't provide for their families. The social needs go up for, for counseling, for healthcare. And so we've got to look at this, not from the standpoint of are we equal with other states, but is our unemployment because of, of the, the COVID-19 substantially above other states. And I suspect it probably is because of our heavy dependence on the service industry. So that, that poll is a benchmark. Now we have to see as we go forward, how do we do other studies to confirm uh, how we move forward? So Ross, I don't know if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, no, you know what I, I'll add is, you know, it highlights uh, the great uh, need to focus on people's current status and to address that. Uh, the Rhode Island Foundation focusing on that. The, uh, the administration uh, in Rhode Island, the governor uh, and the secretary focusing on how could the state start to 
uh, open some businesses, uh, you know, which businesses to have stayed open because they are critical to the state's economy and to employing people. And how do you balance that opening up businesses and the economy with a public health concerns? How to do that in an appropriate way? And Rhode Island being of relatively small scale uh, is an advantage. Uh, you know, the testing capability, the tracing capabilities. And yes, you have to recognize that Rhode Island is a small state and you have Massachusetts and New York close by with, with their current situation in the pandemic. But to have that type of confidence in this administration and have the administration that's in touch with its people and trying to respond to it in an effective way uh, is really an advantage. And uh, you know, I think there's a wide recognition that Rhode Island is dealing with the situation on the ground, uh, understanding through the Bryant University survey and other methods, what's the situation of people all across the state? Uh, not just large employers, but people in small businesses. And then the purposes of this panel, which is, Rhode Island will be strong as much as education works with industry, works with the public sector, and works with nonprofits to deal with the challenges and has, you know, uh, one and a half eyes on the uh, pandemic and the public health crisis, and let's say one and a half eyes on the economic recovery. You have to focus on both right now. You have to think about dealing with the current situation and people's status at the same time. You're thinking about the future and what we have to do so what Rhode Island recovers in a strong way. And it's a way that's not a return to the past because there's a lot of things that you have to address, the inequality. But what industries, what investments in human capital from K through 16 plus do you have to do? And that we have industry working with business leaders like those gathered here and the nonprofit sector and the government sector. And we're having a conversation. We're having this conversation now in the midst of the pandemic. We're not waiting because we have to have this conversation at the same time we're addressing the immediate public health needs. And that's the type of things that we have to do. And I think that's what the poll has indicated that we should be doing. So again, I wanna thank uh, Professor Tobaldi for organizing this. And uh, I'll have to say that, you know, it's not only administrators in higher education that are really committed to uh, the recovery process in Rhode Island. It's fa the faculty and staff have been terrific. They want to be part of the solution. They want to innovate. Uh, and I think that's a real strength in higher education is the expertise, but also the caring, the compassion uh, of faculty and staff and the administrators uh, uh, for the state and the state's population. We've got some questions coming in for, uh, from the public. And so we're going to get to those in one second. My last question is just to underscore the bigger point here is, we, we've talked about how uh, Rhode Island is first in, last out of re past recessions and try, hoping to avoid that this time around. But it is, it, and what I'm hearing here is that we need to change the mix of our industries, change uh, the, the makeup of our economy in a way that makes us more resilient. Who, who would like to answer that? I, I'll start because we, we have spent about three years looking at this uh, technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, materials, uh, all of the new uh, areas of the future. And that's something that's intellectually driven as opposed to building a manufacturing site. And uh, I think that uh, that's something as we begin, it's going to change how everyone is employed. It's already happened, but within five years. And so while we're all of a sudden focused on this pandemic, we also have to be thinking about, uh, as uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tell mentioned, uh, the era in which we are moving very quickly, the world is, and that's artificial intelligence, robotics, and the idea of everyone has to have analytical capacity going forward. Mm -hmm. That means you can't start in college, you gotta start K through 12 in helping our students to <clears> develop <throat> that. And so I, I would suggest uh, that is one area that we need to move beyond just the biotech and beyond materials it's just the whole capacity of understanding this area of uh, technology literacy that everybody's going to have to have. Yeah, no, I, I 100 percent agree with that. And, and, you know, I made the comment before that the industries being affected today uh, look remarkably similar to the ones that were affected in 2008, 2009. So, we need to learn the lesson, and, and as uh, 
President Makeley said, we need to look to the future. And while nobody could predict everything, we can prepare people better. And again, that's getting the state in line, that's getting uh, our budgets in line, that's investing versus looking at everything expenses. And I know in the short term, we look at expenses and we have to balance a budget and we have revenue challenges, certainly even before the pandemic. But we also need to make investments in the long term. And that same dollar can either be looked at as an expense that gets cut like in education, or it could be looked at as an investment for the long term that pays off $10 down the road. And so I do think if we do not make some changes and again, uh, plan for the longer term, we run the risk of for totally different reasons being back here again in 10 years and watching artificial intelligence, watching new industries, wondering why we can't support the lifestyle we want here if we don't get back to these fundamentals. Very good. And Dr. Gattel, any, any thoughts? Yeah, no, what, what I would add is, uh, you know, investment in education, where, which we're emphasizing here, has to be aligned with the needs of the future economy. So we're talking about K through 16 plus, you know, the STEM education, that's critically important. But align with people's ability to solve problems and to engage in an applied way within the industry, within government. So President Akeley, you know, referred to uh, the focus on design thinking. You know, how do you apply knowledge towards problem solving and innovating towards a stronger uh, a business, towards a, a stronger working government, towards a stronger society? You know, RISD is very well positioned, as Secretary Pryor talked about it. So it's preparing education and our students that align with the future needs uh, of the economy. Strong educational foundations uh, in the liberal arts, that's a priority. Uh, the application uh, of the sciences, uh, of the math, uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to apply artificial intelligence in a human uh, and historical context is very important. And what Brian focuses on the business, the practical, the managerial, uh, how to engage in problem solving, how to create businesses, grow businesses, to operate effectively uh, as a manager and, mm -hmm. and as uh, somebody in an industry is really critical. And we have to provide broader access to that and integrate our efforts across higher ed in Rhode Island, which is very strong, very strong compared to other states. And let's build on that to think about how to diversify and shift the industry mix currently in Rhode Island towards a stronger future for the state's economy and also to expand uh, the access to this economic opportunity across a broader population. All right, very good. So we've got some uh, questions from our audience. And uh, before it started, I think we had 400, 500 uh, people tuning in. Uh, the first question uh, is, would you agree to be more economically resilient, we must get more out of our population, more of our population educated in technology positions in STEM fields. Uh, these positions are in demand, pay more, and can, and can uh, involve remote work. If so, how do you recommend we do this? I would like to feel that. Well, I, I would not limit it to STEM because STEM is only one aspect of this future technology literacy, data science literacy is critical. Mm -hmm. Understanding that starts uh, in the uh, K through 12. There should be a coding course in every K through 12 educational process. So they understand what's the bias that goes into coding. How does one not necessarily become a coder, but be able to analyze the solutions which are presented. They need to have strong math backgrounds. I, I think it's going to be really critical in the future that they understand analytics and so <coughs> not just giving them a hard course that no one can pass but helping k-12 through students to realize it can be fun to learn mathematics encouraging women to get involved in mathematical and analytical and, and stem is going to be important uh, genome mapping has become uh, an incredible new technology that's almost uh, at the point of everyone can use a thousand dollars a person. You could get your own genome mapping done now. It used to be a hundred thousand prior to that it was a million. So it's this whole new world. And unfortunately, uh, it's been put on hold because we're now focused on the biology of the COVID-19, but it's coming fast. And I mean, within five years. Very good. Uh, anyone else? 
Right, uh, to go to question two, uh, before the pandemic, Rhode Island and other New England states were facing difficult demographic trends, including lower overall growth, aging populations, and losses in prime working age. What policy issues should be considered to counter these factors? Like Ed, it's Neil. I, I'd, I'd just like to take a stab at that and, and maybe even broaden a little. So those are right. We're one of the oldest states in the, in the country here. We have an aging population, which is fine. It's a lot of good experience. Um, but we need to embrace the diversity of our state. We need to provide more equitable opportunities. And so the converse of some of that concentration are fast growing populations. Um, you know, a younger Latino, Southeast Asian, um, or African American populations. We need to embrace the diversity of this state and look at things um, that are provided and more equitable so that we can balance out when we have some of these other demographics that make it a little more challenging, an aging workforce. So even in manufacturing, if manufacturing itself doesn't grow, the workforce is getting older, we need to replace the workers. So there's opportunity there for younger people here, for getting some of the, the more maybe of the graduates of our colleges to stay here, but also to embrace that diversity and equity. And the other thing in order to do that, we need to provide housing for people. We haven't even touched on this. There's so much to touch on here, but we're not providing housing for the people we need to, to, to live here. So if you wanna build this workforce of the future, it needs to be more diverse. The opportunities need to be more equitable and we need to provide housing. I just add, uh, would like to add to, to Neil that another thing is uh, if Rhode Island starts to come out of this recession, deep recession, faster than other states and starts to add jobs, uh, we'll be able to keep more people here, higher ed <laughs> graduates, where the region tends to lose a lot of the, the graduates of higher ed, and we'll be able to attract people from uh, outside the region, outside Rhode Island, to the state, and that will help with the demographics. Uh, and Rhode Island, as you know, we spoke to, uh, uh, being an area that has uh, relatively low uh, density in some areas, not every part of the state, relative to uh, Boston uh, and to New York City, but with uh, proximity to those areas. Uh, and if we start coming out of this in Rhode Island faster than other states in the Northeast or Midwest, uh, there's going to be more recent college graduates and others uh, that uh, are attracted and stay uh, in New England and specifically Rhode Island. At the same time, if we do things to advance the interests of a broader cross section of the population, we're going to be more attractive to that more diverse uh, population, which has different demographics than, uh, let's say, northern New England, where I'm coming from now, which has uh, the oldest states and they're declining demographically faster than uh, the southern New England states. So, I think uh, you know some of the demographic challenges could be addressed if we get uh, the economic uh, turnaround uh, going uh, in Rhode Island, and we do this investment in K through 16 plus education that some of us have highlighted here. All right, very good. We've got another question. Uh, Stephen Pryor indicated that the future that the future growth relies on material science and health sciences, and that we must invest in these programs in higher ed in Rhode Island. How is Bryant planning on further investing in these areas beyond its successful PA program to contribute to the success of Rhode Island's economy in this sector? Well, Ross and I have uh, been discussing where are the opportunities. Certainly, uh, we believe that there is an opportunity to enhance what we do in our data science and in the uh, areas of healthcare. Uh, our physician assistance program has been incredible in terms of helping the hospitals locally to be able to hire very qualified, educated physician assistants. But, you know, this is one of the issues that uh, every school is going to have to think about. How do you invest in new programs? And what are, what are the bets that you're willing to make? Uh, Ross uh, will have to make these calls in the future. And it's not easy. Uh, and one of the questions is, can you form partnerships with other institutions and other companies. The days of people funding all of their college education only to hope they'll get a job, I think are over. Businesses are gonna to have to work in partnership. Healthcare uh, communities are gonna to have to work with institutions of higher education to develop real uh, innovative partnerships where there is in fact 
at the end of the educational process, a job that someone really wants. Rossell, because you're going to have to make these calls. You know, you highlighted the, I think the real important points is, you know, Brian's, you know, uh, going to invest more resources in areas that provide uh, good career opportunities uh, uh, for students, but uh, Brian can't do it alone in, in Rhode Island in partnership with some strong partners, uh, the uh, Physician Assistance Programs, uh, strong partnerships with Brown University, you know, leveraging uh, their capabilities in a positive way for the state and for our students. Uh, you know, partnerships with industry, you know, uh, sharing resources and creating career pathways for students. And then partnerships uh, with K through 12 education, again, to have those pathways uh, from secondary to post-secondary in areas of future growth opportunities uh, in the sciences uh, and healthcare related professions, because that's where a lot of the, the jobs and career opportunities are gonna be. So, you know, there's things that an individual institution, Brian, could do in concert uh, with the faculty and staff and with developing the faculty resources and expertise. But uh, in a state like Rhode Island, particularly with the higher education capacity, it's doing partnerships and leveraging those partnerships towards stronger programming working together. I've got a uh, question from a Brian student as a, uh, he says, as a, or he or she says, as a Brian student, how will this pandemic influence and inspire Bryant University's higher educational outcomes? I'd say one of the great things we've done in the past is we've not only given them intellectual knowledge, we've given them the skills and the qualities to be highly desirable in the workforce. And so we just got back uh, several weeks ago, last year's numbers, 99% of our graduates had a job or went to graduate school within six months with the average starting salary of over $60,000, which is one of the highest average starting salaries, not only in New England, in the country. So that combination of intellectual capacity, design thinking skills, working as leaders in groups is highly sought after. Now the future will require even more of that. And as we've talked about, uh, the challenge for Ross and his team will be to figure out where to make the bets on future industries, how to develop partnerships, and how to make sure that we continue as an institution that stands out. Because when people are investing the kind of money that today's tuitions cost. They want to know that there is a return on investment. Yeah, I, I would add to that, there's an incredible amount of learning about how to deliver a high quality education uh, using different modalities, different pedagogy, uh, and learning from the experience of our faculty in moving in rapid order to remote instruction and uh, reflecting on that and learning from that and embedding in that the best practices that we could have on a sustained basis to try to uh, create a more flexible and agile delivery of our educational uh, programming to students. So there's learning from this experience and we have to reflect on that, draw upon that to strengthen the educational programs and delivery of those programs and our educational experience using uh, technology in different ways. And you know, uh, one thing the pandemic has enabled is higher education to, to rapidly innovate, and we're gonna learn from this. And our, our last question uh, today is, what are your thoughts on securing a solid economic future by investing in a more environmentally conscious culture? It seems if the economy is going to thrive in the long term, we need to start considering solutions to climate change. Uh, I, I certainly think that's gonna be critical uh, again, while we are focusing on the coronavirus, the climate warming conditions are continuing. Uh, we can see just because fewer people are driving cars, putting out the CO2 and the uh, other uh, uh, SOX uh, contaminants, that our climate is improving around the cities. We need to get to the electric cars as quick as we can go. Now, that doesn't save necessarily uh, the power plants, which are still going to be driving uh, the SOX and NOx, but uh, it will help our environment. We also, and that's, that's technology. That's people working together. <laughs> we're getting closer. We also need to think about uh, how we're using uh, energy uh, and how we're expending our energy uh, with big business. And I think that's all gonna come together, but we can't lose sight of that while we're dealing with the momentary crisis. And the other thing too, is we already have industry commitment. So we're wind power, uh, it has been growing here in Rhode Island, both on the uh, 
uh, energy provider side and also on uh, uh, the technology side, uh, proliferation, hopefully managed well of solar. So the, we're, we're in it. And I think those are opportunities beyond some of the industries that Stefan Pryor mentioned that we can grow while still being conscious here um, and uh, people, you know, doing things a little differently and doing things to, uh, to keep the environment friendly. But like I said, shutting down the economy, terrible thing to do, would never want to do it again. It did bring down gas emissions. It did bring down a lot of things that were destroying our environment. Yeah, and I would build on that, that uh, we're learning that we can uh, change some of our behavior that has broader benefit uh, to society. I think we also learned that uh, if we don't act uh, proactively uh, on some things that we know are eventually uh, going to confront us, there's great economic costs and consequences. Threat. ability uh, to address it in a more timely fashion. Uh, same thing with climate change. How do we act proactively knowing that the eventuality uh, of it and that we do have the scientific ability if we act ahead of time to reduce the great uh, negative uh, costs and consequences that will be experienced if we just wait for that crisis to respond. So I, I think there are some lessons, there is reflections and I think uh, with thought leaders working together, uh, there's an ability to, uh, to this terrible and difficult uh, experience that we're having right now. Very good, very good. Well, I just want to thank our uh, panelists, uh, Secretary Pryor, President Makeley, uh, Mr. Steinberg, and Dr. Gutel. I think this has been a great discussion uh, about the uh, pandemic economics and, and how in the past Rhode Island's been the first and last out of recessions and uh, that, that there are, are ways perhaps that we can uh, try to break that trend, how we can make some investments and focus on higher education and also some of the perils of having the economy structured in the way it is. Um, I also want to thank all those who attended this important and informative panel discussion. We hope you've found it valuable as you navigate the weeks and months ahead here. Uh, two uh, panels are coming up in this series that I want to remind you about. On May 27th at 10 a.m., uh, there'll be a panel discussion, Public Finances in Rhode Island. Uh, this is relevant, certainly, uh, given that the Revenue Estimating Con Conference just uh, reflected an $800 million reduction in expected revenues over two years, uh, just on Friday. Uh, and then on June 8th, uh, uh, there will be a, uh, and, and there'll be a, a member of the Federal Reserve uh, uh, taking part in that discussion. And then, and then on June 8th, jobs and sectoral change at 10 a.m. There's details and registration information available at news.bryant.edu. Thank you all again.